sometimes it gets it gets a little difficult uh, to get here every Sunday morning. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes Sunday mornings is when Satan seems to attack me the hardest and the most. Uh, I want to get out of the house. I want to get things done. And uh, even this morning, I was. Uh, as I was headed to church, I'm still working on <laughs> this morning's message, and uh, that's just uh, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Uh, this morning we're going to continue in our series. We're going to continue talking about the uh, Gospel of Mark and what he has to offer us. But before we get started this morning, you know, what, I don't know if you've heard this or not. Um, McDonald's has this. Uh, this new thing, this uh, new uh, thing they added to your menu. And, and I don't want you to get real excited if you want part of this, because the fact is it's only in available in Japan right now. So unless you're headed to Japan, uh, you can't have it yet. But maybe you've heard about it. Chocolate covered french fries. Yeah. Yes. That's only our pastor with the McDonald's in Japan. Uh, well, you know, they tell you as a pastor you're supposed to keep up on world news, and since I like food, you know, hey, I keep up on the world news. But that's a newest thing. But I promise you, if it catches on, it's going to be right here in the United States. You know that. Chocolate covered french fries. Now, they're two of my favorite things. Baking. I like, I, I, I like chocolate, and I like french fries. But I don't know if I like chocolate covered french fries. Well, I'm not sure if you put them together, they're going to be so good, right? Might not be sweet, John. Now you, you have to admit, okay, and, and well, you don't have to admit, because here's the thing. Nobody ever admits to going to McDonald's. They sell 6 billion hamburgers a day. There's 300 billion people in the United States, and I'm not a mathematician. But somebody's eating at McDonald's. And McDonald's french fries are amazing. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you know a comedian by the name of Jim Gaffigan. Uh, but he tells it tells us all he says this. Has your mom ever made anything as good as McDonald's French fries? Uh, of course not. They're amazing. He's like, have you ever ate too many McDonald's French fries? No, there's never enough. There's no way. You had that moment? <laughs> and, and you know you can picture this with me. I'm riding down the road. And you get to that moment when you're like, <laughs> what happened? Where are they at? And then you start searching in the bag for the bonus fry. <laughs> and, then, and then you got the little box and you're trying to pick out the crumb. <laughs> now you're all laughing because you know it's true. You're amazing. For what, like seven minutes? <laughs> you know, the shelf life of McDonald's french fry is just about seven minutes. And then it gets cold and it turns into something that's probably not even biodegradable. Uh, <laughs> but they don't, I mean, they don't keep you from eating it, right? You find it on the seat and you're like, this thing is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep putting it in your mouth. Just keep on eating it, don't it? It's like some kind of foreign plastic. Put salt on your straw and pick it up by mistake. You wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> but here's the picture I get in my head. You know, my friends invite me over to a party and sitting on the counter is this really great big bowl of delicious looking chocolate covered pretzels. So, you know, me, I'm going over there, I don't get one or two elements on my plate, I get two or three, grab four or five and stick them in my mouth, and instead of being chocolate covered pretzels, they're chocolate covered fries, and they're cold. Yeah, <laughs> sort of a shock at first. I'm expecting pretzels, and I'm getting cold fries. It looked like one thing was something else. Well, that's sort of what we've been talking about in these first eight verses of the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> You know, we found four truths in the Gospel of Mark, and the first truth and the last are exactly what they look like. They are sweet, delicious chocolate. But the two verses in the middle, uh, we think they're pretzels sometimes, and they turn out being cold fries. And it's not that we don't like them, they just sort of catch us off guard. So it takes a while before we get a hold of what we have. And since it's been uh, a couple weeks since we met, or maybe this is the first time you're here, or the first time you, you've been in part of this series, I, I'm just going to refresh your memory. I'm sort of going to catch up. Uh, we've been in this series called Seeing Jesus Through the Eyes of a Faithful Deserter. And the series is based on the Gospel of Mark. The person who wrote the Gospel of Mark is a man by the name of John Mark. John uh, being his uh, Greek name, Mark being his Hebrew name. 
And uh, the reason we're calling him a faithful deserter is because that's exactly what John Mark was. You know, that's what I am. Maybe some of you have done the same thing. He deserted Jesus when Jesus needed him the most. And I don't know if you've ever done that, but I, I know that I have. Now, the good news, and remember, gospel translated means good news, so it can't be gospel unless it's good news. The good news is God gives us another chance. And if we mess up, he gives us another chance. And for people like me, he has to give you another chance and another chance until we get it right. So if you've been a faithful deserter like John Mark or like me, the good news is God loves us. And he keeps chasing after us. And he keeps giving us another chance. Now, if that wasn't true, we wouldn't have the gospel of Mark, would we? Now, when I plan this series, you know, I, I start planning things way in advance. If you look in my office, there's a two-year calendar on there. Uh, I, I knew a year ago I was going to speak on the gospel of Mark starting in January. And my intention was, uh, and what I planned was, that I, I would speak one message on the gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse through 8, and then we just continue to go through the verses. There's something else that hangs in my office. It's a plaque. It's Proverbs 16, 9. It says, the mind of man plans his ways, but God directs his feet. So I planned one lesson on Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and four weeks later, we're speaking on Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. We started on the 10th, went to the 17th, we missed last week, and now it's the 24th, and I'm hoping to finish up these first eight verses, but the mind of man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his feet. So we'll see. Now, in just these first eight verses, there are four great truths, and all of them look like something which is taught in churches today. Something that, that looks like what's taught in all churches today, but hidden in two of them are sort of this French fry that the modern church seems to have forgotten. So, on the outside, these truths, they bring great comfort to us, they look great. <coughs> But it's like expecting chocolate-covered pencils and ending up getting chocolate-covered french fries. On the outside, you know exactly what it is. It is chocolate, it is sweet, it is delicious. But in the middle, it's not pretzel. It's something a little unexpected. And since it was unexpected, you know, it can make us feel a little uncomfortable. You've been into it thinking it was one thing, and it hidden in the middle of something that caught you off guard, something you didn't expect. Well, that, that's like the verses that are right in the middle of these, the four truths that are right in the middle. On the outside, the first verse and the last verse are exactly what we'd expect. And we'll go over a little bit of that in just a few minutes. But right in the middle of these two verses are some deeper truths. Mm. They're sort of unexpected. And, and it may actually even be unpleasant to hear and hard to swallow at first. And because of that, a lot of the sensitive, you know, the, the sensitive secret churches aren't preaching much about that today. So this morning, we're gonna, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through all eight verses once again. And then uh, I'm going to go over what we spoke about the last time we met real briefly, and then uh, we'll get into today's message. Uh, but, but don't worry, uh, I tell everybody, our services last just about 90 minutes, and uh, I'll have you out of here just around 11.30 either way. So uh, the first part's just a review. We, we haven't met in a couple weeks. Some of you may be new to it or you missed one. So if you have your Bibles, turn them to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We have some right here over on the shelf. We, we encourage you to take them with you as you leave. They're our gift to you. They are absolutely free. We want you to take them. Bring them with you. I would encourage you to take your Bible to church and take notes in it. Because if you do, you'll remember what we speak about uh, longer. Um, the verses are going to be up here on the screen but by having your own Bible and writing in it, you retain it longer, and you can remember it at a later date. Because here what, here's what you have to remember. It's not information that we ask for. We're not coming to church to get information. Paul says if you just get information, you can become puffed up and proud. What we're after is transformation. The Apostle Paul writes, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Information without application will not give us what is good and pleasing and perfect. So bring your Bibles, take notes, let God's word, not my word, but God's word begin to transform you by changing the way you think so you become a new person that's perfect and pleasing. 
So reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1, and it'll be read up here on the screens. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare the way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness, and he preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and honey. John announced, someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So much greater than I am that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sin. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the reading of God's word for God's people. So in just these first eight verses of the Gospel of Mark, we, we find these four great truths. And here are the first two, which we've already covered. The first one is chocolate. It's exactly what it says. God had promised a Messiah. God had promised this Savior. Hebrew word is Messiah. The Greek word is the one we normally use, Christ. So Jesus is his, is his name. Christ is his title. God had promised an anointed Savior. God had promised a Christ that would offer salvation from the sins of the world. And God always keeps his promises. Mark starts out by saying the promise starts right here. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And it began just as Isaiah had written. <coughs> Ain't nothing but chocolate, baby. Every zang in there is exactly good news. What God has promised, God has delivered. And then the second truth found in these eight verses of the Gospel of Mark, and, and this is what we looked at last time, and the message was for those of us who claim to be Christians, for those of us who claim that we are very close to God. God's promises are for those who are very close to God. But as we looked at that, we saw hidden in that message were some, some difficult things, some, some things that, that were maybe like a french fry and not a pretzel. And I don't know if anybody else was uncomfortable with that message, but I can tell you it really made me start to think. It really stepped on my toes. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I want you to know that. I, I think we need our stove stepped on sometimes. It helps keep us awake. It helps put us on the right road. It helps to remind us not to get complacent. On the outside, the promise looks great. God's promises are for those who are very close to Him. But if you claim to be a Jesus follower, if you claim to be a Christian, then you know God's promises are for you. You know that. But Mark gives us these words as well. He says, look, I'm sending a messenger ahead of you. And he will prepare the way. And he's a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way because the Lord is coming. Clear the road for him. And this is a physical picture of a spiritual truth. This is a physical picture of the spiritual truth of what we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be forerunners of Christ. If we say we put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing we're to be is a messenger going ahead of Jesus, preparing the way for him to come into others' lives. We're to be messengers of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. If we say that we love God and we made Jesus Christ the Lord of our life, we're commanded to be this messenger of the good news, preparing the way for him. And we aren't just called to be messengers. We're also called to be the voice shouting the good news in the wilderness. And wilderness, to me, is a picture of the sin-filled wilderness of the world. But here's the thing. Most of us don't like to get out of our country uncomfortable. In fact, it was Jesus' last command before he ascended back into heaven. It was right between when he was raised from the dead and then he rose back up into heaven. Now, if you're not a Christian and, and you haven't studied the scriptures and you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to let you know that does sound sort of weird. Dead man rising and then floating back up in the air. But for those of us who have studied the scriptures, 
For those of us who have read the accounts, for those of us that have even studied secular history, we know it's true. It's what we build our hope on. Not a God that was living and then dead, but a God that was dead and is now alive. Amen. Amen. But we like our comfort zone. But God calls us to step out of our comfort zone and not only to be messengers of the good news and not only to be a voice in the wilderness of the sin-filled world, but we are to shout the good news. We are to shout about this Jesus, about this Messiah, this Christ, the anointed Son of God who is offering salvation from sins to everyone. To everyone, not somebody, but to all people. And we aren't to whisper the good news. We're to shout the good news. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you should be shouting the good news of the Messiah. Amen. And the reason I use the word disciple and not Christian is because 87% of all Americans claim to be Christian. But I honestly don't believe 87% of Americans are disciples of Christ sitting at his feet and trying to, to emulate his life. In other words, if you claim to be a Christian, you can't be a solid saint. You have to be a shouting saint. Be a messenger of the good news, preparing the way to be a voice in the wilderness of a sin-filled world that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, has come and it's good news and you can have forgiveness of sin. God promised him, and because God promised him, God gave him, because God always keeps his promises. And if we claim to be very close to God, we're going to shout this good news. But I know that most people are uncomfortable doing it. So here at the Odyssey Church, we want to help you out. You know, in your bulletins today, there's some postcards, and those postcards are really simple. You just hand them to somebody and say, will you join me for church? It's actually even written on there in case you forget what to say. Will you join me for church on Sunday at 10 o'clock? And on the back are directions, because I know we're hard to find. And I challenge you, there's only two in each package. Hand them out to two people today. If somebody says, well, I don't know if I can make it, say, well, I'll buy you lunch if you come with me. Or tell them, I'll pick you up and bring you. Or then shout the good news. And if you're a little uncomfortable, start out simple. Just invite somebody to church. Let the card do the work for you. So that brings us to today's message. And if you're not sure where Jesus is, who he says he is, or... Maybe at one time something happened in your life and you drifted away from God, or maybe you're angry at God, or maybe you just got tied up through the, the thorny parts of life, the, 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 the things of life that just sort of choked you out. And if that's you this morning, then this promise may be for you. The next truth we find in these first days is, is the promises of God are for those who are very far away from God. You need to go two slides. <coughs> We are called as Christians, as disciples of Christ, to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the one who is able to give us forgiveness of sins. John the Baptist is actually a physical picture of that spiritual truth. All through the Bible, God gives us these pictures. And when we start studying, we see that these pictures are fulfilled in the New Testament. John proclaimed it, Jesus fulfilled it. So if we're shouting the good news, sometimes we have to thank ourselves, what is this good news that we're to shout? Jesus, this messenger, was John the Baptist. Now, again, i got to remind you that John the Baptist it is not Baptist. There were no Baptists then. There wasn't even a church back then. Literally, it would read, John the one who baptized it. So it was John the baptizer. But he's a, he's a good example of what Jesus calls us to be. But it's not that we're to be a baptizer. You know, don't let his name get you all messed up because baptism isn't the message. The message is something the world needs to hear and something the world needs to hear very badly today. The message is repentance. And a lot of churches don't talk about that anymore. A lot of Christians don't talk about repentance anymore. They don't speak it and they don't teach it anymore because people don't like to hear it. And what they're afraid of is people will stop coming if they preach it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John's message was a message of repentance. Baptism was the outworking of the message. 
John's message was the kingdom of God is near, so repent. Quit doing the things that you know are wrong. It was a message that the prophets, and what we call the Old Testament, spoke. As Isaiah, and Malachi, and Zephaniah, and Hosea, and all the prophets of the Old spoke, they always spoke of repentance. Quit doing what you know is wrong, and start doing what you know is right. It's the message of John the Baptist, who was announcing and clearing the road for Jesus Christ. A lot of people don't know this, but repentance was the very first message of Jesus Christ himself. As he walked out in the desert to start his public ministry, the first words out of his mouth were, Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. When Jesus taught his disciples to go out, he taught them to tell people to repent. The Apostle Peter preached repentance on what, what most people believe was the birthday of the church, capital C church, the church with the day what we call Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was sent out into the world. Priest Peter pointed his fingers at the crowd and said, you need to repent. Repent is one of the main themes of the Apostle Paul who wrote over half the books of the New Testament. And this is how Mark starts his gospel, chapter 1, verse 4. And in the New American Version, it reads like this. And the reason I chose the New American Version, uh, supposedly, after the research I've done, the New American Version is as close to the original Greek as you can get in the English language. So it reads like this. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Once you repented, your sins were forgiven, then... You were baptized. So the third truth I see in the Gospel of Mark is that God's promises are for those that have never repented of their sins and are therefore very, very far away from God. Those same promises that are available to those who are close to God are available to those who are very far away from God. And as we learned the very first truth, God always keeps his promises. And I want you to hear this because it's important. So, so listen up. When you read the whole of Scripture, it becomes clear that without repentance, without changing the way you act, by changing the way you think, there's no salvation. Repentance simply means, as it's applied in Scripture, is to stop thinking about yourself, stop thinking about your desires, stop thinking about your kingdom, and start thinking about God and His desires, <coughs> and put His kingdom first. Amen. Love God, love others, and tell everybody. It's really that simple. Now, a way to remember that is like this. Who doesn't want to have joy in your life, right? So just think of how you want to have joy. Jesus, others, you. That's, that's the way it should be. Jesus, others, you. Joy. And when you do that, you'll have joy in this world and joy in the next world. Now, let me tell you, repentance doesn't mean without sin or we will all be doomed, Right? I mean, John Mark, this, this, this deserter, sinned on more than one occasion. What it simply means is you put God first, and when you fail to put God first, you seek forgiveness, confess that sin, and repent. And you start back over right where you fell. Being a Christian is not about perfection. Being a Christian is about progression. <laughs> Repentance is a continual process. Salvation can be a one-time thing. Repentance is a continual thing. You conquer one sin, and if you conquer it, you're great. And then all of a sudden, God points out another. Repentance is where you get a place in your life, where the direction of life is towards the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, with an occasion of sin. It's in complete contrast of, of how the world works today. Most people, the way, the way, the way most people are, even, even, and I hate to say this, even most people that come to church. The direction of their life is towards yourself and the things of this world, and then they have an occasion of holiness by coming to church one Sunday morning or, or saying a prayer when they're in trouble or giving some money to the poor. Repentance is when the, your, your direction of your life is towards Jesus, and occasionally you sin. It's not when you sin all the time and walk towards yourself and the things of this world, and occasionally you have a moment of holiness. If God has laid something upon your heart, and he has told you it's wrong, and you keep on doing it, you're still in your sin. And I have to warn you, that is a very dangerous place to be. Yes, it is. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 26, the author writes this, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, 
No sacrifice for sin is left. That's tough to read. Yes, we're all going to occasionally fall. I fall daily. I pick myself up daily. But if your lifestyle goes against what you know is right, if it's in opposition of what God's Word says, then according to His Word, there is no sacrifice sin left for you. Now, and, I, and I admit, I know this isn't a popular message. It's quiet in here right now. But it's the message of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. It's the message of Jesus. It's the message Jesus taught his disciples to teach. It's the message that the Apostle Paul wrote. It's the message of Peter, the disciple who Jesus said he'd build his church upon. And if I don't preach repentance for the forgiveness of sin, then when I get to heaven, as Ricky Ricardo said to Lucy, I've got some explaining to do. <laughs> Now, we're not going to talk about baptism this week because baptism doesn't produce repentance. Baptism is simply a result of repentance. Amen. Baptism Amen. is an outward sign that you've repented of your sins and your desire is to live for God in His ways to the best. And you've got to remember, it's the best of your, home, home, your human ability guided by His Holy Spirit. See, the good news is we don't have to do it on our own. He gives us a comforter. He gives us a helpmate to come along. He has given us His Holy Spirit. And if you have a desire to repent and be baptized, I, I put a card in today's bulletin. You can fill that out, and they're in the back of the chairs as well, and, and I'll contact you, and I'll explain the process, and if you like it and you want to get baptized, we'll have a baptism service. But repentance is the key to salvation. Repentance is the key that will set you free. So the promises of God are for those who are very far away from Him, but this is where it really gets interesting. This is the part I love. You know, As I read the Scripture and try to put everything together... Um, sometimes it's just not as comforting as I would like it to be. I have to admit to you. Uh, you're all probably thinking about somebody who needs to hear this message right now, you know? And I really wish my husband was here. He needs to hear this. He needs to repent and get Jesus. <laughs> I wish my son was here. He quit doing all that crazy stuff. <coughs> I wish my boss was here. The way she treats me, she'd give me that raise I deserve. <laughs> but here's what's interesting. In Matthew's account, we see religious people right there as John baptizing in the Jordan for repentance of sin. And John's not looking at him and saying, you know, you guys are okay. You guys are the religious leaders. You guys are the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You guys are the religious leaders of the time. You're the ones that are so good. I am so happy that you're living for God. It's not what Matthew records. These are the words of John the Baptist. When he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the time, the ones that were supposed to be so godly or so the thought, when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. You brood of snakes! Who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? Prove by the way that you live you've repented of your sins and turned to God. See, they were coming out of curiosity. They were just coming to see what John was doing. They were keeping an eye on him to make sure he wasn't messing up their church. So many churches, and I, and, I, and I hope we never become that way. Do that. You know, I don't want so-and-so to come here. You know, we got a good church right now, but if they show up, they might mess it. He's always smelling alcohol every time he comes in here. Folks, that's who we're supposed to be going after. Mm -hmm. Prove by the way you live that you've repented of your sins and turned to God. Too many churches today are telling people, you know, say a sign of prayer or sign a card or come to the ark and everything's okay. And that's simply not true. You know, we put the cards here. I think it's an important step because it's an outward sign that you've made a commitment. More importantly to me, I, I keep them and I hold on to them and I cherish them because things get tough in this business. You know, you, you hear all the hurt in the world and you see all the sin in the world and, and you just stand over it and you weep. I've got those cards and I look at them and I say, well, I might not get them all, Lord. I've been fishing. I didn't catch all the fish, but I caught a few. And it encourages me. When things get tough. So, so that's why we do that. But, but that's not your get out of hell free card. That, that's not, you know, get your God card punched and you're okay. Too many churches today is just telling people, you know, you can do whatever you want, live any kind of way. All you got to do is say, Jesus is my Savior. But Paul Apostle tells us in these ancient scriptures with it, that have been preserved for thousands of years. That alone should convince you God is who he says he is. They tell us Jesus is the way you're saved and by the way you live. That's how you know. 
Prove by the way you live and you repent of your sins and turn to God. If you come to church on Sunday and then on Monday you go back to work and nobody knows you're a Christian, and your family is surprised if you say you're a Christian, but the people around you don't know you're a Christian by the way you act, I'm not your judge. God is your judge, but there's a good chance that you haven't repented. And therefore, if you deliberately keep on sinning after you receive the knowledge of truth, there is no sacrifice for sins left. And if you don't like that, I'm sorry. You've got to take it up with God, not me, because they're His words, not mine. Amen. Don't fool yourself. Don't give you some kind of false security. Don't let the devil trick you to believe all you got to do is say, I believe in Jesus, and you got your fire insurance. You get in your heaven, free card is punching. You're good, and you keep on living any kind of way you want. Prove by the way you live that you repented from your sins and that you turned to God. It's so simple. But even those who claim to be Christian don't do it. Uh -huh. Not all of them. Yeah. But let me show you something that struck me. Jesus uses the word repent 14 times in the Scripture. Seven of those times are to Christians. Half. Hmm. That's almost as scary to me as Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter in. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast demons out in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. That's a scary verse to me. The truth found in this verse looks so good on the outside. Sweet, delicious chocolate. God promises are for those who are very, very far away from God, even those who claim to be Christians, but still living in their sins. That is true. And that is sweet chocolate. On the inside are all the hard, cold McDonald's french fries. Repent for the forgiveness of sins. And prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. The good news, the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is God loves you so very, very much that he sent his Son to live for you, to die for you, and to rise again so you could spend all eternity with him. And God loves you so much, he does not make you jump through a hoops. So often in today's world, when we want somebody to do something, we bring them in and we give them a job and we give them a list of things that they have to do, don't we? Yeah. And we make it hard. But God says, you know, I want everybody from the smallest child to the oldest man, from the most intelligent to the one who doesn't know anything, to be able to handle it. So I'm going to make it as easy as ABC. Now that does not mean the Christian life is easy. I have to tell you that. Right up front, I think that's another false teaching of today's church. Come to Christ and everything will be great and your life will be easy. The truth is God loves us very much and he wants us to be part of his kingdom. And yes, we are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, by Christ alone. But we have to do our part. And our part is not always easy. It takes us out of our comfort zone. In fact, it's so difficult that Jesus tells us to count the cost before we say we're going to become a Christian. Now, if it was easy to follow Jesus, he wouldn't tell us to count the cost, would he? But over and over and over again in the scriptures, God tells us and Jesus tells us the eternal rewards are so great and the eternal consequences are so bad that it's worth it. God's promise is that I love you and I'm never going to leave you. In fact, he says I love you so much not only... Am I never going to leave you? I'm going to give you my spirit to do what you can't do on your own. And Jesus, who is God, always keeps his promises. And the promises of God are for those that are very, very close to him and those who are very, very far away from him. And all you have to do is prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned back to God. And the way you do that is simple as A, B, C.